I feel sort of nervous about being here and I, when I, I was thinking about what I was going to talk about and uh, there's always a worry about coming from somewhere else and you know saying telling people what they should do or thinking I know everything and you don't know anything and I don't feel like that at all I've already had a great conversation to realize how many things we have in common um, but and what I hope is that there are some universal truths, some things that we share, some things that uh, uh, that we're able, we can learn from each other. I would love to know more, and I hope there's lots of time for questions um, about about you and what you're doing and what you're struggling with. But what I thought I would do was start uh, with telling you a bit about the organization that I helped found. And in a way, uh, maybe this will ha help as a kind of case study of uh, a kind of an organization that grew from individual parents uh, into something that's now a kind of institution uh, in Ontario, the province I live in, in, uh, in Canada. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about about people for education and then I'm going to talk about parents and families and from two different perspectives. Uh, one from the, the, the perspective of, of how parents, uh, what the research says about how parents can be most effective just with their own children and I know we have a tendency to kind of go yeah yeah there's that kind of parent involvement and then there's the other kind but I think it's important to sort of uh, reinforce that. So to talk about that and then about talk about um, what parents and families can do and school communities can do um, as advocates and what are the, you know, what are the, the, the things that work really well in the kind of danger areas in that advocacy. Um, so, and, as, and particularly in terms of advocacy, not just for education, but advocacy for, for children and youth, because I think we have a tendency uh, in education to kind of isolate ourselves from, from other areas, and that part of the strength of families and parents can come uh, when we work together with, with, with the other uh, sectors, if you will, that are working on, on issues for children and youth. So, People for Education. Um, we started 17 years ago. Uh, my children were very small then and now they're big. Um, and we started uh, really in a time in Ontario when there was, um, when we had a government that was very anti-public education. It cut a lot of funding from the education system. It started by attacking everybody who worked in the education system. So teachers were going on strike, schools were closing. There was a crisis. Um, one of the government officials even talked about how the way to make change happen uh, was to create a crisis, and they did. Um, so there was a crisis in education, and all, every conversation about education was kind of a polarized debate. You were on one side or the other side. Uh, and both sides were saying, we're putting children first, we care about children the most. Um, at, the, at the same time, I, you know, I had little children in school, I was a parent in a school, and we were being asked to fundraise, um, which was quite common, still is quite common, um, but at that time being asked to fundraise for math textbooks. And, and we were concerned about what that meant to the kind of fundamental ideal of public education, that, that it's supposed to give every child a, a, a fairly equitable chance for success. What did it mean uh, in the schools where they couldn't fundraise for the math textbooks? Did they just have to go without them? And yes, indeed, at that time they did. So there, there was this, kind, this time then of cutting funding, of a government sort of attack on education. And we decided, a small group of parents in one school initially, um, that it was important that there be a, some kind of voice in the middle, some kind of objective-ish uh, voice uh, to talk about is issues in education and to, to bring a different perspective to the table, and particularly to bring a different perspective to kind of the public conversation. Um, so our uh, it was that ideal that drove us, that ideal that every child should have an equitable, equitable chance for success. Um, and, and, and it was our belief 
in a kind of civil society way. So we weren't so concerned about education from the inside, how you taught you know, one thing or the other. And again, I was a theater director. The other people, parents who started this organization were, uh, one was a lawyer, a real estate agent. None of us were educators. But we had this, this belief, a belief in public education. We had a belief that it could change children's lives. Um, and it could overcome intergenerational cycles of poverty, it could create a sense of social cohesion, it could strengthen our, our, our culture because it's really part of who we are in Canada. About 95% of uh, children go to public schools. Um, and it, that public education, when it lives up to its potential, can provide uh, children and students with all of the skills and knowledge and capacities they need not just to get jobs, uh, but to thrive in the 21st century. Um, so that it, it was important to us that it be the education be be broadly based in that way. Um, and so for us, what what's impor what was important was that we we remember and recognize and and talk about the fact that the job of public education was to build the next generation of society. So we came at it from this big perspective and we thought of it really from from the outside in so not so much again from you know, what was happening inside classrooms but more what kind of country or province or community or neighborhood do you, did you want to live in and if that's what you wanted what what was school's role in that um, again what kind of students did we did we want to be graduating in order to create the kind of country we wanted so we grew from this little tiny group of parents um, and it's, it's an interesting conversation. It, we, we've been talking a bit about how and why we grew. Um, but uh, the first thing that we knew is that we were we wanted to um, we wanted to build the public conversation that we had to get money in order to do this. We applied for funding to foundations, and we knew we wanted to operate independently of the system. So we weren't uh, even though unions were very active, and we were talking with them and there were various bodies that were very active we wanted to keep our independence so we could never be accused of being the voice of somebody else so we work now in four main areas and the first one is research and the, the research for us was important because we knew we had to have evidence that it wasn't enough to just go around having a big opinion about what should happen um, that we had to have evidence to back it up and we were talking at the time to uh, a group of nurses and they were saying that they thought that somebody should be keeping track of the effects of uh, policy and funding changes in healthcare, because there were a lot of changes happening there, on, on tangible things. So they wanted to track the birth weight of babies uh, and things like that, health outcomes. So we decided that in education, uh, that we would do that in education, that we would keep track of the effects of policy and funding changes on schools. Um, so we developed a survey that goes to all the schools in the province and for us it was a way, it was that thing about, uh, about public policy, it was a way for us to, um, we asked parents to keep track of what was going on in their schools and just to count things. So um, do you have a librarian in your school, a music teacher, are there waiting lists for special education programs, how much fundraising do you do, do you have a caretaker, things like that, things that parents uh, cared about. We developed the survey with a lot of people that they cared about it and that, that were understandable. And in a way for us it was to build that sense that policy wasn't something that lived far away and was very, very complicated and nobody could understand, that policy eventually had an impact, it had an effect on you, on your kids, on your kids' school, and that if you knew enough about it or if you had the evidence that you could affect it back that you could have a voice because you had had the, 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 the data there to support your, your voice. And we actually, at the beginning, which we wouldn't call it now, uh, because we're a little bit less activist now, but we called it arming parents with facts. And, and it was a very important part of how we started was that. We, at first, universities thought we were kind of cute and not very important because anybody could count things. Uh, but after a while, the universities start, we started working with universities too um, because then we were interested in, so we know if schools have librarians, 
uh, does that make a difference to actually to the outcomes in schools? So we started working on with universities on other kinds of reports on the the impact on education then of what they had or didn't have in their schools. Um, so we put out these reports. Um, now we have an annual report uh, uh, that we put out on schools. We have a report on school councils um, and a number of sort of different uh, special reports on things like special education, the arts in schools, which I still very much care about, things like that. So we do the research so that we can have the evidence to have a voice. We do a lot of communicating, and I think that was the other thing that we knew right at the beginning was that um, we didn't really want to be a lobby group uh, because we didn't want to be inside the government having secret meetings and making deals. Uh, we wanted a public conversation. So we made friends right away with the media. We understood how important it was to tell stories um, and to get the media on board as, uh, you know, that we, would, we were credible, that we weren't going to make anything up, um, and that they could come to us for information. So uh, we do a lot of work that way we have a lot we do a lot of work with, uh, in social media also in online we have online dialogues um, uh, we have a big website um, as you heard where people can go for information but it's again to 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 engage the public in the dialogue about public education because, again, we think it's important for everybody, not just for parents. We do do work on policy, so we, t we make policy recommendations coming out of our reports. Uh, we sit at some government policy tables um, and we work sometimes with policymakers. so when we're bringing out a report, we will go tell the government, this is our report, this is what it says, this is what we think you should be doing. And last but not least, uh, we do parent support. Now, when we started as an organization, we didn't think, even though we were parents, we didn't think providing support to parents was going to be part of our job. It never occurred to us that that was going to be our job. But what happened, uh, you know, we were probably... Naive is a very kind way of putting what we were. I think that we assumed that all parents could just enter into this discussion and all parents wanted to be there uh, and all parents had the same capacity to, to be advocates. And that is, as I'm sure you all know, and we should have known too, totally not true. And for many parents, the education system itself is a barrier. Um, so they don't particularly want to be advocates for the education system because they already think it doesn't work even at their own school level, or it doesn't work for them, or they feel excluded on the basis of class, or because they came from another country, or maybe because their children have special education needs for many, many reasons, or because the system can feel very complicated to navigate. Uh, for many reasons, I'm sure here too, and in Canada definitely, there were lots of parents who didn't feel part of the system anyway. So, so asking them to advocate for it was much too big a leap. And, uh, and not because, I, I don't want it to sound patronizing, you know, not because they didn't have their children's best interests at heart and not because uh, they didn't know what they wanted, but because the system, again, itself wasn't, wasn't one that they felt that they belonged to, in or to. Um, so we, we started then uh, developing, we have now tip sheets for parents in many different languages because really one of the things that we, we learned is that it was important that we were useful to parents. So it wasn't enough just to come and say, you should all be advocates and we should all talk about these things. Uh, parents had to see us as helpful to them. So we, again, we have tip sheets, we have a phone line, parents can phone and ask questions about how the system works. Um, we have, they can ask questions online too, we provide workshops because for many parents just that navigation of the system is difficult. And uh, one person said uh, it's as if the public education system works on a series of secret handshakes and our job was to let everybody know what those secret handshakes are. Um, because there is a lot of class in education and a lot of people don't feel uh, that they, they belong. So for me, the beginning of this conversation, sorry, now I'm at the beginning, uh, about, about parents has to start uh, with, with that understanding. That's a really vital place to start. We ha and we have to start 
um, I think by, by recognizing and respecting and, and taking seriously how complex the job is of being a parent, just that. Um, and it's funny, but you know, you'd think I would have known that more when I had young children, but I feel like I know it more now that my children are older. Now I know all the mistakes I made, now I can see it uh, more clearly. And, and I also know now that there are that being a parent is, is it's not easy. Um, it's a very big, huge, complicated uh, responsibility. I always worry that I'm the only person who found being a parent hard quite a lot. Um, I had to live through two teenage girls. I always worry every, for everybody else it was easy just for me that you know my children would tell me what a bad job I was doing or how no other parent said things like that. But I think actually for many parents it's a kind of it's it's a it's because so many of us have children, we just assume we should know how to do it. Or, you know, that, it, you know, I always equate it, this is a weird thing to equate it with, but it's like it, when your parents die, which my parents have done, and you sort of go, oh, well, you're old, of course your parents died. But nobody says to you, even though everybody's parents die, it's a huge, enormous thing to have in your life. So even though a lot of people have children, it doesn't make it any less significant and, and, uh, and, and really, truly complicated an undertaking where you're always wondering, what should I be doing now? And kind of second guessing yourself. So I like to start there, even though I know that's not necessarily the topic of this, because I think it's very important when we're thinking about the politics of engaging parents that we recognize first um, just the plain old job of being a parent and how hard that is. So we have, uh, over the last couple of years, undertaken quite a lot of research then looking at parent involvement. Um, and we did a big, huge literature review just to look at, uh, to see what the evidence was or what researchers were finding around the parent involvement, the kinds of parent involvement that makes the most difference in terms of student success. And we have a tendency to focus on the involvement we can see. And we have a tendency to sort of talk about involved families or involved parents as the ones who are active either in their schools or in the political sphere. But in, in a way, that kind of doesn't uh, give enough credit to the amount of involvement that parents have at home and the complexity of that involvement at home. So for us right now, one of our most important messages that we're trying to get to everybody in the world and everybody who works in the education system in Canada is that part of their job is to let parents know at home that there are four really important things they should be doing. Um, and we got it down to four because we thought it was important that it be easy enough to communicate to parents. And again, this goes to uh, trying to get away from this idea that there's a kind of hierarchy of, of parent involvement. There's important kinds and unimportant kinds. And really, in terms of student outcomes, what parents do at home matters more than anything, much more than their involvement in school. So for me, the first job as an advocate is to let parents know that, and that, that among all of these researchers, 30 years of research from the United States and Canada and England and other countries, and studies of hundreds of thousands of children, there were four things that came out that parents did. And what's interesting for us is that these four things cross uh, socioeconomic lines, they cross, it doesn't matter what language the parents spoke or if they went to university, um, what mattered that was that they did these things. And the first one was that they have high expectations of their children. And this isn't, you know, fighting about marks, this is just letting your children know that you, you know, you believe in their potential, that you assume that they're going to work hard and that in our family, uh, you know, we care about school. So that sense of high expectation was the number one thing that made a difference, and again, to all families. The second one was talking to your kids about school. Again, these sound easy. Um, our research director, who has a PhD and has a master's degree in law, and you know, it's very knowledgeable. At the, initially, we were writing a tip sheet to say, and we were going to say it's as easy as one, two, three, four. Um, but then one morning she came in in tears 
and went, it's not easy. We can't say it's easy because she'd been fighting with her, I think, four-year-old about getting dressed to go to school. And that notion that it's easy is, you know, again, we went, okay, we have to recognize it's actually hard. Anyway, number two is talking about school, which isn't necessarily easy. But what was interesting about it is was that it was more important than homework, more important than helping with homework at all, more in hope, important than limiting TV time, more important than saying they couldn't go out on a school night, was just uh, home discussion, they called it, so conversations about school. So we've developed tip sheets now for uh, teachers and principals, because sometimes you ask your kid about school, they, they go, uh, I don't know, or nothing when you ask them what they did. Um, so we've developed tip sheets so that teachers can actually s make the homework, ask your parents these questions, thus the conversation about school happens. The third one, which I was worst as, at as a parent, um, had to do with building um, good attitudes and work habits for your children. I was hopeless at that. My daughter last year discovered that when you have a job, you have to go every day or you get fired. She, it took her four times to learn that, but I think she's learned it now. Um, but they, so building the work habits, though, is not about doing their work for, her, for them. Again, it's not about their homework. It's actually about letting your kids struggle. Um, so it's about letting them learn to be persistent, to figure out how to go and get help, to um, be able to deal with difficulty and handle distraction and, and negotiate their own crises. So again, it's not about doing the work for them and you don't have to be able to do their math or know the history or read the textbook. That's their job. Your job is to, is to support them and get them to learn that this is part of what they have to do. They have to grow up and they have to take responsibility themselves. And the last one I think everybody knows, but not everybody does still, which is reading with your children. And for us, what's important about these things is that we, there's a lot of uh, research done in Ontario actually looking at how much this happens at home because they survey kids and it's not happening at home. So the reading with, again, it's not about teaching kids, it's just about the joy of reading. It's just about the experience of reading with them. There was just a study in the UK where they track, been tracking kids for a long time. The kids whose parents read to them when they were five were doing better when they were 16 on reading, in reading, writing, spelling, math, in everything. Um, so it's understand from it is it is very important I think that we again that we take seriously this job and that as advocates or people who want to build advocacy that we offer parents this useful information first uh, and that we communicate this with parents. So for me, it's, you know, first of all, understanding that parents don't necessarily want more jobs to do, even though I know some do. Um, they actually want more support. They want more information. Uh, they, they want to feel that they're not alone in their, in their kind of uh, quest to try and build, bring up their children to be responsible adults. And, and so the job of schools then somehow is to build that uh, to, to make that interaction happen well. So building school sense, so then the people who work in schools, the teachers, the administrators, the school system sense, that their ro part of their role has to be communicating with parents, not asking parents to do more, but, but communicating with parents. That's, that's the first uh, job to do. And, and parents can be incredibly effective advocates for education, but we have to make sure that we kind of nurture that relationship because parents don't want to be advocates for education that either they don't understand or that doesn't seem helpful to them. So we have to recognize that communication and communicate with parents where they are. And then if we sort of go the next step and we go, okay, now we've kind of got parents on our side and now they're in the school and we were having a conversation then about school councils, um, we can bring parents into the school, but we have to be careful again because um, it, it's easiest, and this is where this conversation gets complicated, it, it's sometimes, we have a tendency to sort of listen to the loudest voices or even worse, a tendency to think because my voice happens to be so loud, Everybody must agree with me. Um, and, and we have to watch that because, as I know you all know, um, 
some people have much greater capacity to make their voices heard than others. So we have to really think um, when we're listening to, to parents um, about how we can maintain a balance between real listening and real desire uh, to, be, to have that interaction with parents, a balance between that and making sure we're, we're uh, taking care of, uh, we're making sure our policies do the best they can for all the children in the system, not just the children of the parents with the loud voices. So first we have to, rec we need schools to recognize the serious job of parents, we need to ensure they're welcoming, um, we need to build that sense of collaboration, and then, and then we have to think about how we involve parents at the decision-making level. I heard in your introduction that uh, there are parents going, they want to be there, be part of choosing the administrators of schools, the directors of schools, I think you told, uh, called them. Um, that is true, that is happening in some schools in Ontario, but there are other people worried about which are the parents who get to be part of that, who is really at the table uh, that's part of that. And, and what we have to be careful of is that sense of, of um, uh, social capital, that some parents have social capital, so they have the education, the income, they, they are, uh, you know, they're born in the country, they are from a certain class that feels that sense of entitlement, that they get to be at the table where other parents don't necessarily. So in Canada, and I hear uh, just as here, in Canada, we're divided. Every province and every territory runs its own education system. It's part of our constitution, so they're totally divided. Um, but nearly all of the provinces and territories have school councils. Um, at the school level, some have some kind of council at the regional level, and some have provincial, some sort of provincial representation. Um, it's always problematic because it's really false to call it representative because you can say there are elections at the school council, but really usually if you walk in the door, suddenly you discover you're the president of the school council. That's what happened to me. That's how I ended up the chair of my school council. Um, so it's not as if there are people clamoring to be on the school councils. Um, when they were first set up, school councils were basically set up for two things. One, uh, for accountability, which I think is similar to here, and one to include parents a little bit more in, in decision, some decision-making uh, processes. And the involvement, the structures um, across Canada and certainly in Ontario are all sort of effective in some ways and very problematic in other ways and in the same ways. Um, they have increased the somewhat the transparency and somewhat the accountability so there is a sense that there are parents there kind of watching uh, and that has worked um, but they still tend to attract the same very small, not representative group of parents that they always did. In Ontario, nearly half of the student, uh, students are uh, second generation or visible minorities, but nearly all the school councils are totally white. They're totally middle class. The parents are university educated, so they're not representative at all uh, of the schools that, that they um, supposedly represent. Um, we survey school councils all across the province and we ask them what they think their most important role is and interestingly enough for us, though they were set up to improve student achievement and to do school improvement planning, they actually say a very small minority list that as their most important role. The majority say uh, that their most important role is communication and we're happy with that because we think that's their most important role too, is to be able to build this sense of community without parents having to come into uh, the school. But you can make a community if you have the people in the school willing to communicate out. So you can build, we can build governance structures that include parents, but we have to be incredibly careful about how we do it. Um, it's not easy and we have to be incredibly careful about our assumption that everybody agrees with me or us, um, because sometimes us are, are not what everybody agrees with. Um, so for, for us, the hard part is, has been, and the interesting part, and I think that it's the job in a way, is to instead of uh, building support for parents to be more 
uh, active or more effectively involved in certain ways. It's to actually build the space uh, where parents feel that they can be uh, in all their kind of differences, so that it allows for the differences. Parents aren't a system. And there's a tendency in the education system, because it's a system, to want to interact with another system. So it likes to kind of, we like to try to then systematize, which isn't a word, uh, parents. Um, but they're not really systematizable. Their parents kind of have all different political perspectives. They, they have different beliefs. They come from different backgrounds. They have really strong, really differing opinions about how education should work. Um, we have parents who phone us and go, there should be more homework, or parents who phone and go, there should be less homework, or they want, you know, more math, or, you know, more arts, or they really don't all agree about the things inside education. Um, some are very, very, very angry about the amount of testing that we have, because we have standardized testing in Ontario in grades 3, 6, 9, and 10. Other parents love the testing. They like it because it's a nice, simple way, they think, uh, to judge the success of the education system. They like it because in the end you get a graph that's sort of up good, down bad. And it's like, excellent, now I know everything I need to know. So we have to recognize that parents come at education from many, many different perspectives. And we have to then try to I think, and I think from our experience, it's been shown to work this way, that if we can build a space uh, independent, uh, independent from the system that's, that's recognized by the media, because we think, uh, and we are sure, that policy really changes by uh, pressure from the outside, much more than by the inner workings of the policymakers, that if we build this space where there can be an active voice, and if we look for things uh, on which we can agree, or debates like this, where you can actually debate things um, that are a little bit more overarching. So right now, uh, People for Education, what we're looking at is how do we define success in education? And this conversation, you can you can sort of start to find more agreement or or more people that are well that are that are willing to have the discussion in a different way so we're worried that we've we've narrowed the definition of education by uh, just focusing on uh, reading writing and math, literacy and numeracy uh, it, those things are very very important but uh, we're kind of driven by the PISA scores by the OECD by the scores on this the tests inside Ontario and that sense that you know we got to get the scores up and then the education system will, will be better we're worried that by focusing on that, we've actually we put all of our, our our policy, all of our a lot of funding, a lot of pressure on the system to do better in those ways, and we've lost uh, health as a very important aspect of education. Health writ large, mental health, physical health, social, emotional health, uh, the arts, uh, which are really getting kind of uh, squeezed out of schools, uh, a lot of schools in North America anyway. This sense of citizenship, how are we educating our children to be active, engaged, involved citizens. And again, I mean, in Ontario, we measure, we measure how we're doing on the test scores and we measure graduation rates, but we don't talk very much about what kind of what kind of graduates are they? What kind of capacities do they have? And those kinds of conversations um, are ones that, that we, are, we are finding engage more people. The danger is that it's easy to get parents involved when there's a crisis. That is how we started. Um, our joke always is, meanly, you just have to threaten to close uh, a, a school and then parents are instantly involved. Um, and that has happened a lot in Ontario because we have declining enrollment. Um, but the hard part is, how do you keep them there? How do you keep parents there in the long-term feeling that having this, this voice is important? And I guess what's important is that it's not a voice. Uh, it's voices. So now, the government in Ontario, and right now we have a pretty friendly government, but it's it's gone you know it's gone through a few changes. It really cares uh, not just what we say, our organization. It cares because 
We have thousands of parents engaged with the organization, and they know that. So our job now has become to let parents know about policy, uh, to take academic writing, which sometimes academics you know, think they're very special and write in their own special language, take that writing and make it uh, into language all parents can understand. So again, parents have the tools they need to be advocates. We're, we're working hard to reach out to other kinds of organizations because we know education is just part of a kind of ecosystem uh, that, that, uh, so that poverty, health, recreation, social services, education, they all work together or should, uh, and they all interact with each other. So for us, our advocacy now is about reaching out to other organizations, about building this space for the conversation to happen, building a space where people can, can wrestle and disagree, um, but where we can come out with reports uh, that, uh, that are taken as, as credible. So it's really in the end about about supporting parents, uh, providing them with the tools that they need, um, building that big kind of tent, uh, which then allows us to, to talk about these, these bigger issues. Um, and that by doing that, then you end up with a voice for public education. Sometimes parents will advocate for things you wish they wouldn't advocate for. We have been very surprised sometimes uh, by, we, and we've wanted to go, we didn't mean that. We didn't mean you should be asking for that. Um, but we haven't, we've tried to stay out of it in a way. So again, for us, it's providing the information, providing the tools, providing the sense of support, providing a place that parents can go to, and then saying, okay, you guys go for it. You can have a voice in this way. And I think that it's that, that, that independent sense uh, that then allows, uh, that gives parents a lot of power. Um, and I think that up to now, parents have, have felt, uh, well, I think that because it's exhausting being a parent and that if I'm doing something in my children's school, isn't that enough? Um, that it's been hard for them to, to take those other steps. So for us, it's been about you're already an advocate for your child and we're going to help you be an advocate for your child. We're going to recognize and acknowledge that that's the first thing you want to do. So we're going to provide you with everything you need to advocate for your own child. And then it's like little steps from that advocacy to advocacy for your school, then maybe advocacy for a whole bunch of schools, and then advocacy for public education. And, and even in a funny kind of way, it goes back to reminding parents and uh, often teachers too, that this thing that is public education is, has the pet potential to be transformative, that it's a, it's, a, it's a jewel that we have, that there are many, many countries that don't have strong public education systems. The, in the United States, they're, they've privatized a lot of their public education system. It's seen as a system that's for poor people and not for anybody else. So it's partly reminding everybody there are lots of problems in the system, yes, uh, but public education is incredibly important and it has a potential to, to as I said, to change kids' lives. So it's, it's again, I, I've already said this, it's, it's, it's recognizing how serious the job of being a parent is um, and then providing the space for parents who want to, uh, to be advocates, to be involved in the system in, in, at, at, in different, at different levels, but not assuming that they're all going to agree on one thing or another. I think there is a common denominator. I think, uh, and this is going to sound maybe, that maybe this is going to sound too uh, utopian or maybe a little bit naive, but I, I had a, con the, uh, or something, anyway, once I had a conversation with a, I was talking to a group of Somali mothers, uh, and these are parents who came as refugees, they, they had been in Somalia, then I think they'd been in refugee camps for years and years and years. Uh, in Egypt, they came to Canada, their children were very badly served, and so they, they seemed, they couldn't be more different from me. 
um, you know, they and they are culturally incredibly different, um, hilariously different for very white, waspy parents. The Somali mothers yell and they stand up and they don't take turns and, and the system just like hated them because they were too scary. But when I was talking to this Somali mother, she finally went, you don't understand. Our children are killing each other, which they were. There's a, been a, t there's a terrible problem in Toronto for the second generation Somali young people. And in that moment, and this does sound really stupid, but you'll have to forgive me. What I recognized was we were parent, we were just both mothers. It made me cry what she said, she cried. We were just mothers talking to each other, the end. And there is something, 99% of parents want their children to do well, to do well at school, to get jobs, to be happy, uh, to, to prosper, to hopefully leave home and learn to pick up their towels. Uh, you know, they, they want want their children to be okay, and that is the thing we have in common. And really, after that, the end. We all have different routes for getting there, but appealing to that, and again, recognizing it and taking it seriously, is the thing that brings us together. We go, oh, we're all parents. And where we really can share with each other is about how hard it is to be a parent. So it's building that recognition first, not just saying, yeah, we know about this, that part, now we're gonna talk about something important. It's to say, that is the important part, now we're gonna talk about ways to make it better or ways to support that. What we've been trying to do now is when, for instance, the government has a call, consultation, we send other people. We go out, we find newcomers, we find other people, and we say, the government's having a consultation about this. Hilariously, they had a consultation about uh, about uh, for newcomer students, so English language learners, they are in Canada, um, and they asked us to come. They didn't ask any newcomer parents. They didn't, you know, it's the same as what you said. So for us, it's going out and finding different than not the usual suspects to be there at the table. And often where those people are is they're in their own community organizations, they're in a mosque, they're in a church, they're somewhere else. They're not the people you see on the school council. And, and it's doing that outreach, which is hard, uh, makes a real difference. Or sometimes they discover you and they go, hey, you know, this, this might help us. You know, we're working on this and you've made information in the language my parents speak Let's try and work together. So that is one way of doing that. Keeping people active when there isn't a crisis is incredibly hard. And, you know, sometimes I, you know, we go to meetings in schools and everybody's very excited and they, and five people are there because there isn't a crisis. So why should I go to a meeting? Why should I have to do another thing? I could be at home you know, watching TV, reading a murder mystery, whatever. So I think that, that what we have to make sure is that we're, we're not trying to just have meetings or keep people there uh, without clear purpose all the time because it's very, there again, you're just going to go back to who's at the table because you're just going to get people like me. You're just going to get people with loud mouths who feel that everybody should know their opinions about everything. You're not going to get anybody else, people who like going to meetings. Um, those are not representative of most people. So for me, it's again, it goes back to how are you useful? Because if you're seen as useful, then okay, maybe I'll, I'll still stay involved with you even when there isn't a terrible thing happening. So, or I'll see that... I can, you know, I can go online and you're going to help me with some other problem or you're going to give me some information about how to be a parent, which is still, bottom line, what I'm caring about. I think that often parents are seen as, uh, oh no, you know, here come the parent, as a problem. Um, I think one of the things that, that helps is, is talking to teachers' organizations about how parents are the best advocates they have, for one thing, the education system has. It's been hard sometimes in Ontario convincing the teachers' organizations 
that, but no, you can't run them, which they've wanted to do. Um, but it's to, so it's to, to, to build in that idea that, that p parents are good advocates for education. But I think even more than that, I, I don't know what it's like here, but I, in, I know in Canada, I don't think there's enough uh, in teacher education about working with parents. Um, so that there is a tendency to either dismiss parents or to see parents as a kind of pain in the ass. Or, and parents do. Parents only come when there's a problem because that's what you do when you're a parent. Uh, you only come when you have a complaint. And so there's a, there's a tendency on the system part to get very defensive. Um, and so I think a lot more work needs to be done with teachers not about parents having power, but about the initial personal interaction with, with parents. So that when I come with a problem, I come, I mean, I've had, I'll tell you my very best, worst interact, well, I, I had so many. Um, but I, my children really turned out very nicely, but sometimes it wasn't easy. Once I went to a parent-teacher interview, and my daughter was in grade 11 then, and that year she chose mostly never to go to school. She always skipped school. Um, and I went to my parent-teacher interview and I said, hello, I'm Molly's mother. And the teacher went, oh, Molly, she is so wonderful and she does this and she does that. And when you're a parent, if your child is doing well, you, you assume it's because of you. You know, this is because I am a great parent. And the teacher was going on and on and on about Molly. And then I said something and then she went, oh, that Molly. And it just, I was just devastated because I realized, you know, no, I was a terrible parent actually because of course my daughter was awful at school um, but I think that for me what I wanted from teachers was I wanted to, I wanted help I wanted to be understood I wanted to feel a sense of support I wanted them to recognize that for me anyway sometimes being a parent was a struggle um, so I didn't want to be judged but you have to build that in schools, and so it's part of the, the, the administration issue, part of for teachers in their federations and in when they're learning to be teachers, to build into the idea of school uh, that, that parents are, that parents have a big, and you know, I'm saying the same thing over and over, but that parents have a, a big job to do, um, and they want support doing that job. So yes, parents may come only when there's a problem and they're mad at you, but if you could just remember, it's okay, this is just the first thing that parents say, and to try and figure out how to help, that it would go a long way. And I think that, you know, even just to be self-serving, if teachers and administrators did that better, parents would want to be advocates more for the system. I think that, that your question about parents not having the energy to, to you know, do more involvement in a way is the same as the question about how do you keep parents there when it's not a crisis. And, and it's being able to show to parents that, first of all, what you do at home is the most important for your own student, but that on the other hand, building that community in a school uh, it br it brings you a lot of other kind of support. So that, that, that being part of building the community um, it will then you know, bring you support as a parent, allow you to access other kinds of supports. I always tell parents it's a way of knowing all the gossip in the school, uh, that you know, really if you're on the school council, you'll learn a lot of stuff you won't otherwise. Um, but it has to be true, though, that, that there is really a community at the school and you really, that being there will, will make a difference to you. It may not, I don't think we should sell it as this will make your child do better because the evidence does not back that up. It's, it's, there, there is no evidence that says that volunteering at school makes children do better. But there is a lot of evidence about uh, the about what school communities can do for, for their community as a whole uh, and for building that sense of support for teachers, uh, for building a kind of reciprocal uh, conversation. So again, it's, it's good to go back to the evidence, but it's not trying to drag parents in uh, just to have meetings. So it's partly uh, give me what I need. You know, I have a teenager who's skipping class all the time. Have an evening where you just talk about my bad teenager to me. Have things that help me as a parent at school. Because then I go to the school and then I go, hmm, it's not so bad here. 
maybe I'll do that too. So the first thing is providing that support. In a way, if we situate the discussion in the things I care about as a citizen, uh, then it, it, maybe it, 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 it's a different way of thinking about it. So if I think as a citizen, I care about the gap between rich and poor, for instance, uh, which in most of the world is growing, um, and I go, I care about that, then, then if we who are advocates for education can go, and if you care about that, one of the places that we need to do something about that is in our school system, or one of the places that we can try to begin to do something about, there are other places too, but we shouldn't talk about those, uh, that we can begin to try to, so there's a connection, so that the things I care about as a citizen may be connected to, you know, and in all likelihood are connected to public education. Um, and and the, the message for me about homework is really important because you're, you're right that there are, there are big assumptions made, sometimes by teachers, sometimes by the whole system, that parents will help you do this. And a, a principal who read our report on, on parent involvement said, oh, you're saying there's too much parenting at school and too much teaching at home, uh, which was exactly right because for many parents then, if, if, if your, the assumption is I'm gonna help you learn your uh, history or do your math, then I don't feel that I belong in the system. I, I feel excluded because I can't do that. So it's really important that we get the message out that homework is for kids, it's their problem, it's their responsibility. It, it is not one of the ways that leads to success for parents to help them. In terms of the reading, there are two parts to that. But first of all, it's reading in any language. So it's very important that reading to kids, it doesn't make any difference uh, what language it's in, the, your own home language. And it's very important to read to kids in your own home language. Um, because it just it builds that sense of this is this is you know the culture we come from for one thing, and a sense that for the parent that again I'm I'm I can experience this with my child. Reading isn't some weird thing that comes home that I can't do. I think that you're right that if uh, but I don't know about the evidence about this, but I'm sure that kids uh, reading to their parents is is also probably a wonderful activity. What's important is that it's fun, that it's joyful, that it's loving, uh, that it's, it's felt as a good experience reading because children's attitudes towards reading have an impact on their education and on their lives. It makes a difference for their whole lives uh, how they feel about reading. Um, so we just have to make sure that it's not felt as a pressure on a child who's just learning to read to be able to read something to their parents. I can't answer a question about Marriage is also a very complicated thing, uh, on which I am not an expert, though I am still married. Um, but I think that what you said first about children feeling loved um, is incredibly important. And I think that, I think there's a little bit, I could be wrong about this, in our world, uh, this sense that uh, of our kind of individual drive and need for success. You have to, you know, do things that are important. You have to get a job. You have to be successful. You know, even on a, on a country level, we have to compete in the global economy. Uh, we ha I, I feel as if we've, we've grown a tendency to ignore that part. So when you say that, that, that parents have to love their children, it's like, well, we don't talk about that in you know, serious meetings like this. Um, but in fact, we should talk about that. I think you're right. And I think that, that it, for schools, th there was a kid making a presentation at something I went to. And what did he say? He, I think he said, he came from an incredibly troubled home. He said, the thing about life is it follows you everywhere. And it was so moving. But what he meant was it follows you to school. And I want my school to know that my life comes with me here. So he wanted, his family had totally fallen apart and was full of drugs and, you know, was really in a crisis. But he wanted the school to understand that what he was going through and what students talk about, which again, we, maybe we don't take seriously enough, is they care about their relationships in school. 
Um, so, you know, they care about how their parents feel about them. And then when they're at school, they care about that human relationship. So in our project right now, where we're push, having this initiative to change what we measure in education, one of the things we want to measure is, is the culture, the climate of the school. Um, because that climate involve, has to do with the relationship between students and teachers, teachers and parents, uh, teachers and each other, teachers and the, the administrator, the school and the community. But that climate uh, makes a huge difference uh, to students. So I don't think that we can sit here and solve, you know, the marriage crisis if there is one, or, or the, you know, the, the difference in, in how families operate. But we can recognize that that we're we're human beings, and that you know, and that life follows us everywhere. I think it really goes back to communicating with parents that actually if they want their children to be successful at school, it's about focusing on being a parent. Um, so that, that it's, it's being, as opposed to, you know, buying five more parent books, that that time you spend with your children, uh, as long as you're, you're instilling and, you know, they are values in your child, uh, that those are the things that make a difference in terms of their, so they're not school things, they're parent things like going for walks, having conversations, showing them that you love them. Those are, and in those conversations, you know, saying you have high expectations of them or having conversations about school. So I think it's part of the, the same thing. In terms of what we're working on at People for Education, the biggest one right now does have to do with um, how we engage parents and the public in this conversation about uh, really the definition of education. Um, that we know that in this era we people like measurement, it's here to stay, uh, so then it's very important what we measure. We're not advocating for more testing in schools, but we're definitely, we're working with teachers, with principals, with school boards, with the provincial government, but again from the outside to say, let's look at what we measure. Um, we've looked at research from uh, many different places. We have an advisory committee from across Canada and from some other countries. Uh, to look at what, it, what it's possible to measure uh, to ensure that, that education has the broad definition that we think it should have. And we're doing that at the same time as continuing to focus on our outreach. So how do we, how do we engage more parents? How do we keep on engaging new, young parents? Um, and how do we engage a um, bigger cross-section of parents? And I think those are two big enough jobs. Um, in terms of the managing the, the difference, that's hard. And part of it has to do with evidence and using research. Um, and I will describe a conversation I had. You brought up choice. Um, so uh, we have written a bit and talked a bit in the media about the issue of uh, moving to a system of specialty schools and choice. Uh, because we've looked at the research, so we looked at research from North America, from England, from everywhere we could, um, and it doesn't all agree, but there is an overall sense that in the research, when you have a system of specialty schools and choice, uh, you end up dividing uh, students along socioeconomic lines, um, and that the, the choice is open to those with the capacity to choose, and that the choice that happens is they choose not the neighborhood school, but and and the, and again they choose the school with the high scores. That's why it's really important that we're measuring school on, on more than reading, writing, and math. When I've said this publicly, I had one person come up to me in a drugstore, you know, crying uh, because I because I had said even schools for the arts, which my child went to, um, I said, it really, it's a problem. They end up, the families end up all being white, middle-class families. We, we shouldn't be doing this. And 
and it, to her, it was if I'd betrayed my, my tribe, my group, um, because it's really, you know, among parents like me who want to be able to make those choices. And all I could argue with her was there's evidence, and the evidence says this, because parents don't want to think that. They don't want to think, I just want to send my child to a school where everybody else is white and middle class, even though they may believe that deep down inside. Um, so, th but that's a very hard pushback right now in everywhere, I think. And the pushback has to be there because that's a kind of privatization of the public education system to move to a system like that. Um, so it's hard, and in Ontario, they're just becoming more and more schools, a school for you know math, a school for boys, a school for girls, a school for artsy kids, and 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 it ends up dividing populations. But it's the same thing about you know fighting for for smaller class size, which I have done uh, wrongly. Um, we then went and looked at the research and went, you know what? Doesn't really make a big difference, you know, if, whether your class has. 27 kids or 24 kids, or even 30 and 22, um, and it's very, very expensive. Um, and is this really where you want all the money to be going? And as parents, instinctively, there's an instinctive belief that smaller classes are better, but there's not really the research to back it up. So part of respecting parents is assuming that parents can understand research and be be uh, swayed by the research to go you know what don't fight for this there's other things to fight for you know fight for more music teachers there's lots of good evidence about that but class size there isn't um, it and it is hard uh, the uh, that kind of not in my backyard feeling or the I'm just going to fight for my own school and pushing back against that is very difficult. Right now we're working on a project, we're looking at um, Aboriginal education, so Canada has a first, a, a you know, fairly large population of Indigenous people, uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit. Uh, they, some of them go to school on reserves and the the schools there are appalling, and all Canadians feel ashamed, but they kind of go, that's terrible, that thing way over there. Um, they don't feel it has anything to do with them. Um, but actually, most kids, which people don't know, go, most First Nations kids go to publicly funded schools. They go to, you know, everybody's schools, and they're also not doing well. So we are pushing now, parents, to, to say this is all of our cause. This isn't a cause for just those people over there. This has to be my cause too. And, and they are pushable a little bit. So, but it's, it takes, you know, the research, the numbers, the, oh, I didn't know 96% of schools have Aboriginal students. I had no idea. You know, we, we survey principals and they said, well, I don't have to worry about that because I don't have those kids in my school. Well, you do have those kids in your school. So for us now, it's about, flipping it and going, this can be a cause for all parents. We can make a difference together. So, you know, but there are scary things like the law you talked about in California, which is, you know, they have a thing, it's called the parent trigger law. Um, and this is parent involvement gone insane. And this is what you have to be careful of. You have to be careful what you wish for when you want parents to be more, uh, you know, have more authority in the education system. There are many parts of the United States now that have parent trigger laws. Um, and how that law, and it's a law, how the law works is that if, and I can't remember, but if a majority of parents, but it's a vote and hardly any parents vote, decide that the school is failing based on its test scores, they can have the school closed, they can have the principal fired, and they can have the teachers fired. And really, the majority is really often a very small minority, but there are the active parents. So this is the kind of, you know, this is parent involvement. Uh, this is parents very involved in the education system, but it's parent involvement gone mad. Um, and it's happening really a lot in the United States. So again, it, 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 the idea of parent power, or because parents aren't necessarily, there's a hard tension between the expertise of experts, of people who've studied education, thought about education, uh, who know a lot about education, and the, and the different kind of expertise that parents have. And there are a lot of people who can be very uh, dismissive 
Uh, they say things like, education's too important to leave to the educators, which I find a really appalling thing to say. Um, and those people feel that parents should have more power, they should be running their schools. The hard part is finding the balance, is getting educators and the people who have a lot of expertise about education to listen respectfully to parents, um, to find ways for them to work together, but to not go too crazy one way or the other, not to, not to tip that balance, so that either parents have all the power and they're firing principals because they've decided they know better how to run the education system, or that the people who work in the system have all the power and feel that they know better than those kind of not educated parents. And that's a hard tension to find, but it's really an important one to struggle with. Okay, I think there was one more question. Okay. Um, I'm still on the wrong time, so anyway, so you said there was a survey of 60% of principals saying they, they, they encourage participation in their school, that they're happy about it as part of how they advertise how good their school is. I'm sure that that's true. I think that sometimes uh, there, are, there are kinds of participation principals love, and then there are kinds of participation they'd rather not have. So they would be happy that parents are involved, that they're engaged, that they're being volunteers in the school, but maybe less happy if parents are coming to them and saying, we don't like the way you're doing this, we want you to do it some other way. So participation can have uh, many meetings, meanings. When uh, in Ontario they, they survey all the principals and what the principals talk about is that they're really good at um, communicating with and working with parents about sort of events in the school, the activities in the school, and even the principals admit, and I can't remember the percentage, uh, that they're not very good at communicating with parents the, the kind of academic goals of the school, or they're not very good at, at the, uh, having that interaction with parents about the education that's going on in the school. So I, I think there may still be a struggle there. I, I think that principals want parents there to be helpful, and so they should. But again, the, the, the tension is, uh, do they want parents there who want to be a little bit political? Uh, who, and, and those are really kind of fun, hard things. Some schools and some school boards are very brave about going, okay, you can, you can be a little bit more active. Um, but sometimes it's hard. You know, sometimes parents want to send out newsletters that are very political and the principal probably rightfully has to go, no, you can't do that as the voice of the school. Um, but on the other hand, principals can encourage the school to be a space where parents can have some of those hard conversations. So I think this sometimes the system, where, where the, the system has to be careful, is that it's sometimes a bit, uh, it can be a bit patronizing with parents, or it can say, we love parents when they're working hard for us, but we don't love parents uh, if they're uh, being difficult. And, and so that the, the system then has to be able to deal with that tension. And again, it's back to the messiness that parents aren't a system and they're not going to react in a nice, simple system way. You know, we made these 10 points, we're going to stick to them, that's how it's going to work. <laughs>